Hello and thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins. My name is Laura and today I am reviewing the John Stamos memoir, If You Would Have Told Me, which was released in October 2023. And John Stamos is of course most well known for playing Jesse on Full House. And like many people, I did grow up watching Full House. And like many people, I did have a crush on Uncle Jesse. However, I have not watched Full House in a long, long time and I never watched Fuller House. And I haven't seen too much with John Stamos. <laughs> like maybe if he like makes an appearance on something I'm already watching, but I am by no means an avid John Stamos fan. So I will caveat my review with that. But the reason I wanted to read this book was because a while ago, like a year ago, maybe he was on the Dax Shepard podcast, Armchair Expert, and I loved the conversation they had. And it made me want to hear more from him. And so this was months ago, but I made a mental note to be on the lookout for his memoir come October. So once his memoir was released, I got it and read it. And unfortunately, I was pretty disappointed by it. I felt like he just was stay too surface level, you know, like a great memoir is one where the person is vulnerable and open and they share like these thoughtful insights about their life and about their experiences. But he didn't really do that. He just kind of stayed on the surface. And I don't know if his ghostwriter is to blame, Daphne Young, or maybe he just didn't provide his ghostwriter with enough. Maybe he only provided her with kind of these surface level things. And so maybe she had a hard time making it come across more deep and vulnerable because maybe he just wasn't providing her with enough. Or maybe he just didn't want to get vulnerable I don't know, but like, what's the point of a memoir if you're not going to uh, go deep with things, you know, and get personal? Like, that's what makes a great memoir. And if you're not ready to do that, then I mean, I guess if you're a fan of John Stamos, you would probably still like this memoir. But I think a great memoir, it doesn't matter if the reader is a fan of the celebrity or not a great memoir. You know, Janet McCurdy, I didn't watch anything with her. And yet her memoir was fantastic and I loved it. So John Stamos, just because I'm not like a fan, it doesn't mean like I, it's a guarantee I wouldn't like his memoir. If it was well written, then I still would have loved it anyway, you know? <laughs> so I'll, I'll say that this memoir seems more aimed towards his fans. Yeah, I just didn't think uh, he was insightful enough and he didn't get deep enough on certain things for non-fans to get as much out of it. And then he also has, has sections where he's talking a lot about other people, like not even his family. Like I'm fine with him talking a lot about his family, but he has a chapter, he talks about the Beach Boys a lot, but then he has a chapter that really focuses on the Beach Boys, which I get, I want to hear about the Beach Boys because they're a big part of his life and he drums for them and just what their music means to him. But what I don't need to read is just like a Beach Boys biography where he kind of talks about their past. And I mean, when he talks about Dennis Wilson, he kind of relates it to himself, but, and honestly that chapter on its own, I probably wouldn't have minded. But soon after that, we get another chapter all about Don Rickles. And so it was just too close together. And so it made me just annoyed because I'm not here to read about the Beach Boys and I'm not here to read about Don Rickles. <laughs> I'm here to read about John Stamos. So why are you telling me all this information on these other people who, you know, like I get he was close to them and Don Rickles was a good friend of his and like their friendship meant a lot to him, but I'm not here to read it about Don Rickles. And honestly, like I don't care about Don Rickles. <laughs> so that whole chapter came very soon after the Beach Boys chapter. And so it just felt like back to back, he's talking a lot about other people. And it almost came across like he was deflecting, like not wanting the spotlight to be on him. So instead he's sharing other people's stories, but this is your memoir. <laughs> talk about yourself, okay? That's what you're supposed to be doing. But also another thing I didn't like about the Don Rickles section is multiple times in that chapter, he defends Don Rickles' racist jokes. And I just highly disagree with his views on these jokes. And I wanted to share these two sections where he talks about this. This first section I'm gonna read, he is at a show where Don Rickles is performing. And during the performance, Don Rickles like points to the audience, like pointing at people like an Asian woman and a Hispanic man. And then he makes racist jokes about them. When his act is over and the lights come on for intermission, I look around the very white Republican Orange County crowd. There was no Asian woman and no black or Hispanic men. He was just pointing into the dark and doing his act. I realize he's a master of social wizardry. At the root of mocking things we're not supposed to make fun of, he's diffusing them. Deflated by humor, the power of slurs and stereotypes is diminished. He delivers his punches with a flat expression. And just as everyone looks nervous, he laughs a little and we all laugh with him. We laugh at each other and then we laugh at ourselves. Uh, and so when people try to defend racist jokes, like how he says, deflated by humor, the power of slurs and stereotypes is diminished. Like, no, <laughs> a slur and a racist joke is still offensive and still hurtful. It doesn't matter if you're doing it as a joke. 
and it doesn't matter if you're doing it like to get people to laugh at themselves. And the fact that he's making these jokes in front of a white audience also just seems weird. And like, why are you defending this? And as if that wasn't <laughs> bad enough, there's another part where Don Rickles had been on Jimmy Kimmel and he made some joke about President Obama, which the joke is here, but I, I didn't even get the joke, but it was offensive. And so Jimmy Kimmel cut that bit of the show. And then we read, Jimmy doesn't want Don to come off as insensitive or unaware that those types of jokes are problematic in today's climate. The thing is, Don can't come off as insensitive because he isn't. He's above all the correctness because he's always used humor to tease out the cruelest, darkest, most mean-spirited aspects of society and make people face their own bigotry and hatred. Don wasn't making fun of President Obama. He was making fun of the racist who put an African-American in a subservient category. Don was mocking racism by personifying the most desperate aspects of it. Those who don't get it are likely the butt of the joke. Don lampoons life itself, but his legacy will be one of love. Ugh, so again, like, when he's like, if you don't get it, it's because you're the butt of the joke. So are you saying then if like another ethnicity is offended by these racist jokes that it's their own fault and that they just don't get it and they're not understanding the humor and like, oh, he's not being racist. He, he's not like making fun of you. He's making fun of the racists. Like I've heard that defense before when people defend racist jokes, but at the end of the day, a racist joke is a racist joke. And also it is not a good look for a white man to defend to be defending another white man's racist jokes. Like, really? Like, who are you to be saying like, oh, it's okay for him to say this because he's just demonstrating the worst side of human nature and he's just, he's representing the bigotry and racists. And that's what makes it funny. Like, I just highly disagree. And yeah, reading that part in the book was uh, a turnoff and I didn't like it. And honestly, partway through this book, I did consider DNFing, but I have DNFed like, maybe I'm in a reading slump because this was like the fourth book that I wanted to DNF. But I really want to hit 100 books by the end of the year and I only had like two hours left. So I was like, just power through, Laura, you can finish it. <laughs> and so I did. Um, but as I was writing this review, I was trying to think of like an interesting or like an anecdote that I liked enough to share in this video. And I had a really hard time thinking of something. Like he talks about his parents who were very loving. And so it was very wholesome hearing about them. And then also he talks about with his son, how he like tried to get his son to laugh as a way to bond. He wanted to like make his son laugh. And so when he was a baby. And so that part too was just very endearing and sweet. And then when he talks about Full House, that was interesting as well. And how like initially he thought he would be the focus and the kids would just be background. But they were taking a lot of time casting the kids and he was like wow like they really care about the details because they really are invested in who plays these kids even though these kids don't really matter and of course <laughs> come the script read he realizes that these kids have a ton of the punch lines and then he's like jealous and upset and, and he wants off the show but of course you know in the end he comes to love all these kids and loves being on full house and he and bob saget butted heads a lot early on and they did not get along but again that too over the course of time obviously they grew to love each other and were like brothers which also Bob Saget, his humor, like I don't find funny. And so I should have known that if John Stamos, you know, as someone who is so close to Bob Saget, that probably reflects on the fact that I probably won't find John Stamos that funny either. And there were like a few moments that were relatively humorous, but for the most part, his jokes just didn't align with my humor. So I'm not saying that like, no one will find this funny. If you like that kind of humor, then yeah, you'll find this book funny. It just isn't my personal preference. And then also he is sober. And so I wanted to hear more about that, but he like barely talks about that. He kind of talks about how he started drinking more when he was on Broadway and how he would like drink one bottle of wine a night to like have the courage and energy to do these shows and how that eventually led to more drinking and how in Australia he had like these horrible, these interviews that went horrible because he was like hung over and drunk and just embarrassing himself essentially. And then he also briefly mentions one occasion at a rehab he was at where his counselor told him to like write all of the resentments he has about his ex-wife. And he had a ton of resentments and a ton of anger towards her. And then afterwards, the counselor is like, okay, now write what part you played in like that marriage ending. And so that was like a moment where he was like, okay, like, I guess it wasn't all her fault. And I guess I did play a part as well. And that's all he mentions about rehab. <laughs> and so he just did not delve into his addiction recovery like at all. Again, just keeping very surface level. And then also with his ex-wife, he does kind of 
speak negatively of her. And I just thought it was unnecessary and a bit too much. But yeah, at the end of the day, I gave this book two out of five stars. So a pretty low rating. And I feel like I've had a good track re record with celebrity memoirs because I've read a lot that I have loved. So this is like one of the lowest ratings that I have given a celebrity memoir. But again, other people on Goodreads, there were like other like four or five star reviews. So I think ultimately I was just not the target audience. But if you're a John Stamos fan already, then sure, you should read this and you'll probably like it more than I did. So comment down below if you have read this, comment down below if you watched John Stamos, you know, on Full House and General Hospital and ER. He also did a lot of Broadway, so that would have been interesting to see him in a live production. But yeah, this just wasn't what I was wanting from a celebrity memoir. I just love the ones where they're just so open and just so raw, you know, and so honest. And I feel like that would be so difficult to be a celebrity who you're already in the public eye and you have so little privacy, but then to write a memoir and just really put it out there, like I really admire that. And also like, I feel like the more open and honest you are, the more you're able to connect with people. So, and also like, I know this was ghostwritten, but the, I have read celebrity memoirs that were ghostwritten that were fantastic. Like Elton John's memoir, he did not write that but that was an amazing memoir and like Elton John's voice and personality just came through so well in the writing and again he was just so vulnerable and open and funny and I absolutely loved that memoir although he does do something similar where he defends Eminem and like Eminem's offensive lyrics he says like oh like that's not actually what you know Marshall Mathers as a person that's not actually what he thinks it's his alter ego Slim Shady and so like he defends him being like oh it's his alter ego so it's okay for him to say whatever he says but even that, like he's defending Eminem's homophobic lyrics, but at least it's coming from Elton John, who is a gay man. So it makes a bit more sense. Not, I still don't agree with him. And it's not like Elton John speaks for all gay people or something, but it, it at least was a bit more fitting than John Stamos. Like I said, a white man defending another white man's jokes. But anyway, I still really love the Elton John memoir and I would highly recommend that. I would also highly recommend Matthew Perry's memoir. He again was just, he shared so much and he was more focused too. His focus was on addiction and his addiction recovery. And so I like that he was more focused. Granted, you know, he talks about his career and friends and everything, but yeah, his memoir was amazing. I would highly recommend it. Of course, he passed away recently. So rest in peace, Matthew Perry. And then, yeah, I'm glad my mom died was of course amazing. Viola Davis's memoir was fantastic. Lauren Graham, I loved both of hers. I meant to do a video, but then I just never did. And then I lost my notes on it because I accidentally deleted the file. But anyway, I'm going to be filming a video in the coming months where I tier rank celebrity memoirs. I'm just wanting to read a bit more before I make that video. So comment down your celebrity memoir recommendations and I will read it in preparation for that video. So thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, don't forget to like and subscribe if you have not already. And I will go ahead and link to the Matthew Perry video here, you know, in his honor. And again, especially if you are someone who likes to read about addiction recovery, I highly recommend his book. I really loved it. And he does, he doesn't like delve into friends in detail. So if that's what you're wanting, you're not really going to get it, but I would still recommend it. It was fantastic. And yeah, anyway, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.